I'm outside Westminster Kingsway College. I'm about to go in and meet Jose Suto for one of his game lectures and seminars. Yeah, uh, this is what they call a fallow cricket. So it's basically a first year fallow deer. That's why it's got long, thin antlers like that. Um, fallow, as I said to you, were introduced by the Romans. Uh, and then also the, uh, during the Norman conquest, I said these deer were introduced as well. Um, the young males are called prickets, so this would be a pricket. Uh, an adult male is called a buck, a female is called a doe, and a young one is called a fawn. Um, top there we've got basically young fallow does, which are all females, basically with none of them got antlers. So the females don't have uh, antlers, the males will have antlers. Um, and then here we've got a pricket, which is pretty much the same as this one, actually, it might even be that one. <laughs> Um, and then the bottom here, we've got a full adult buck with, with these large antlers, very, very big antlers on top there. So, <coughs> fallow bucks have palmated antlers, which means that they are flat. Palmated, palmated means it's like the flat of your hand. These are two sets of antlers on here. Okay. And they're very different to the antlers that we would find in something like a red deer. A red deer does not have palmated, doesn't have the flat, it has the points. Now, antlers are made from bone, right? Antlers are not porous. And these, these are two of the antlers around. I'll pass these around so you can all have a feel of them and see what they're, what they're like. Um, they're quite heavy. And, and uh, they're on the flat part of the antler. If you look at it, you'll see all these little lines on the inside of the flat of the antler. And what that does is the antler, when it's growing, it grows from a protrusion that comes out of the deer's head, at the top of the head. And that protrusion then basically grows bone from that protrusion. Now that bone is covered by a, a, a sort of a velvety subject, right, which is called uh, it's called velvet. It's like a carpet that's carpeted around the outside of it. And within there, you've got blood vessels, nutrients, uh, all basically being fed to the bone as it grows. And once they basically get to full size, then what happens is that that velvet that sits on the outside becomes itchy. And what the deer do is becomes very irritable for the deer and they rub them up against trees. They just rub their, their antlers up against trees like that. And what you'll see is basically the, the velvet drop off in strips and it looks very bloody underneath. And it's not hurting the deer any, any way because the velvet is being fed by the blood. But it becomes irritable as they scratch it. Now you've all heard the term when something is in tatters. Yeah, if you've got something in strips and tatters. Well that, that comes from deer because when the deer, the velvet's falling off, they are in tatters, they're all in strips. As time goes on, the blood recedes from it, yeah, all of the velvet comes off and then they harden off to that, to those antlers that basically you guys have just been holding. A horn is different. So a horn comes from things like antelope, uh, cows, um, and um, things like goats. And what that is, is basically it's carotene, right, which is, which is like the stuff that's on your fingernails, yeah, and it's like matted hair, which then grows out of the head. And then that's got a constant blood supply. So if you look at a horn, a horn has a little blood, a bit in the middle, which is alive. So if you actually take a horn and cut it off, it bleeds profusely because there's a live bit in the middle of the horn. Where with an antler, once the antler gets a full, full size, if you cut it off, there's nothing there. There's no blood in it. So the other difference as well, with antlers, they fall off every year and they grow new ones. With horns, an animal grows it all its life. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger as the animal gets older. Okay, so there's a big difference between an antler and a horn. So, like I said, the, the fallow bucks have palmated antlers, yeah, which are very different. Okay? Fallow also come in different colours. So you have basically three different colours of fallow. You have uh, black or melanistic fallow. You have common fallow, which is one with spots. And then you have white fallow. Um, fallow, in the common fallow, is basically what we normally see. If you look on the lateral line on the bottom of the body, it's one complete line that runs along the inside of the body. There is another deer, which is a seeker deer, which in the summer coat has the same sort of markings, but it's individual spots on the bottom as opposed to the lateral line. So it's worth pointing out because later on we'll see that. But they come in all different colours. The black fallow, a lot of them were introduced basically during the Norman conquest. Yeah, and by um, uh, when the Normans came over, they basically brought over. And there's, if you go to areas of places like Epping Forest, there's still quite a lot of black fallow there. They're actually not black, they're sort of a chocolate brown colour. So fallow deer, basically the um, seasons are the 1st of August to the 13th of April. So fallow bucks are in season, they've been in season for a while. Fallow does, 1st of November, they've just come in season, the fallow does and they'll go out on the 31st of March. Now most of these dates are the same for most of the year. There's a few variations, most are the same. 
But um, going for basically 46 kilos up to about 94 kilos, and those go 35 to 56 kilos. These are head off, feet off, um, just the carcass. Right? Uh, basically, if we're looking at whole animals, we're looking at a lot more than that. We're talking about 100 plus kilos right, on a whole animal. Next one, red deer. So red deer are the largest of our deer species. Uh, we've got staggy, spiker, stag for adult male, hind for a female, and a calf for a youngster. The top there we've got basically the red coat it's in the summer, which is obviously where they get their name from. Uh, in the winter they go basically this sort of like a wintry coat, which is sort of more of a dark grey colour. All deer basically change their coats depending on the time of year. And then there we've got that velvet that I was talking about, so covering the outside of the antlers and the antlers are growing. Here we've got a young stag which has two points, the same as the prickit, has two points that comes out. And at the bottom there we've got royal stag which has got 12 points in it. A two point is anything that you can get a wedding ring on. Right, that counts as a point. So, red deer, uh, season is exactly the same as the fallow, yeah, and weight much bigger, yeah, 65 to 90 kilos, right. We have had from Epping Forest, uh, not from Epping Forest, sorry, from um, Thetford Forest. 160 kilo deer, right? Okay, they are absolutely enormous. The deer in the south of England, red deer in the south of England, grow bigger than red deer up in the, in the Scotland and the Highlands. It's because basically all to do with nutrition and food. So if you go down to Dorset um, and basically in Thetford, because there's so much more nutrition and food, and obviously down in Dorset, Devon, all those sorts of places, the grass is known to have lots of um, nutrients within the grass. Yeah, then those deer will basically grow much, much bigger. And the hinds go basically 60 to 80 kilos. Even 80 kilos is a heavy animal. You know, it's a heck of a lot of meat. The largest meat to bone ratio of any of the deer species that we have here in the UK. So it's the largest species. Deer farming. So there are three different ways in which deer are farmed. So there's basically sanctuaries or deer parks. And this is suitable for fallow deer and red deer. And the deer are kept in large fenced off areas of wild countryside where they are born and they live in them until they are shot in the field. So they're not taken to abattoirs. Very little human contact. To all intents and purposes, these deer are wild and they act wild. They don't do well with human presence when they're so anywhere near them. And these acre, these acreages could be seven, eight, nine thousand, two thousand acres of just parkland, enclosed parkland, where these animals just roaming around. Okay, there's a little bit of supplementary feeding, but pretty much they eat everything there. And they'll have in there water, they'll have a woodland, they'll have open ground, they'll have everything they need. Naturally farmed, suitable for red deer. And this is because basically this is more like sheep farming and red deer do well with a bit of human contact whereas fallow deer do not like any human contact, they're really skittish. Um, and they are basically born and for the first year they're, they're brought in and weaned uh, for the first winter, sorry, and then they're pushed back out onto the fields and the fields might have things like uh, turnips, um, sort of barley cake, things like that basically where the deer are out. They've got a certain amount of human contact and then they're taken to deer slaughterhouses. Yeah, um, where the deer are arrested and then put to pasture before being slaughtered. So it's pretty much like any farm down. And then slap farming. Now slap farming is something that I don't particularly like, but this is suitable for red deer. The deer are weaned, brought inside, and then they're kept on the concrete floor, floor and fed a high protein cake, which makes them put on weight uh, more quickly, and they go to slaughter sooner. Produces a fairly good quality animal, but at a cheap price. Really, we're trying to farm a wild animal, right? And it's a very unnatural way of farming this animal. The animal should be basically on grass, it should be out in the fields, it shouldn't be basically doing this. We've had problems in the past where we've taken an animal right and we've tried to farm it to our own means and it's not worked out. Well, this is something we shouldn't be doing, you know, but I, I can see with the deer. Deer should be basically outside, you know, rather than being put on this. Next deer species, the roe deer. This is the, again the second of our um, indigenous species that we have. And we've got a young buck, a young buck and adult bucks, both called roe bucks. Uh, females are called does and youngsters are called kids. In the winter they have this greyish coat, and in the summer, like the red deer, they have a reddish coat, yeah? The roe bucks have basically a very small set of antlers. So the antlers are basically normally with six points, so three points on each side, and then they have like this little knobbly bits that go all the way up the antler, which is called pearly, yeah, which is very, very pretty, and it all goes to the top. Roebucks basically very <coughs> different season, very different season. The bucks basically are in season from the 1st of April to the 31st of October. So actually, they are out of season now, and when all of the other deer, deer, season, deer go out of season, 
they come into season. Okay? And the females basically have now just come into season the 1st of November to the 31st of March. Now rhodia are really unusual because rhodia are a real survivor. So with most of these species, they eat less in the winter because there's less food around. So basically their metabolism will slow down in the winter. But with this deer, it's such a small deer that in the winter, if we had a really, really bad winter with really lots of snow and stuff like that, the deer wouldn't be able to sustain itself because they all become pregnant basically in the summer. It wouldn't be able to sustain itself and the, the, the actual fetus that it's growing inside it. So what would happen was basically they lose a lot of these fetuses. But this deer has found a way to get over that. And it's called a thing called dysplasia. And what happens is the deer become pregnant around about the end of July, beginning of August. And then they're inside the, the female deer, the egg is fertilized, it starts to grow, and then it stops growing. It's held in suspended animation. And it's held in suspended animation all the way through the winter. Yeah, so it doesn't tax any of the basically the food that the mother is eating. And as we're coming into the spring, it then starts to multiply again and starts to grow. So then the fetuses are all basically uh, are born around about the same time as all the other deer species, which is an incredible thing. Yeah, but the reason they do that is because if there was a really severe winter, they wouldn't be able to take it. Now, bigger deer, such as the fallow deer, they don't need to worry about that because the fallow deer basically get pregnant, they carry the fetuses, right, and they're large enough to sustain basically food that they need and the food basically that the uh, uh, the fat that they can, and obviously the food that they need for them to survive and also for the uh, uh, for the fetus to survive, so it's not a problem. If there's a really harsh winter, then what will happen right, is that the actual, these animals will abort the fetuses, yeah, because they won't carry them if there's not enough food to sustain them and the fetus. But with these guys, that will never happen. Yeah, because the road deer will also have sometimes twins and triplets, yeah, where it, although fallow deer sometimes can have twins, it's very rare. Um, weights anything between 10 to 20 kilos on a carcass. So it's not particularly big carcass, but a very, very fine grain, lovely venison. So reef munja, <coughs> again one of the smaller deer species uh, that was imported from Asia, as I was telling you earlier on. So it's buck double form. Uh, a little bit unusual, right? Adult bucks um, ha and adult females all have a very pronounced suborbital gland, which is this thing here. It is a tear duct in the front of the eye, right? And it's a really enlarged tear duct. So these deer have them as well, but they're not as large. So it's just there. You just see that tear duct here in front? Now that suborbital gland, for a smaller deer like this, what they do is they use it to basically central. And it's also a musk gland, right? So what do, what do we use musk for? Cologne. Cologne, perfumes, yeah, perfumes. That's where, and that's where musk comes from. The original musk used to come from a musk deer where that gland was pulled out and it was used to make perfumes. Yeah. And then, so these deer have that there because they're a relative of the musk deer, they carry that. And when you when you see a clean skull, they have a really deep indentation just there where that gland sits, okay? So they because these deer are so small, they live in dense undergrowth, they will basically put scent trails through the undergrowth, yeah, by using, like working that gland into twigs and stuff to leave the trail. Because they also have tusks, yeah, as well as the antlers. The males have tusks and antlers. Yeah, the tusks can be quite sharp. Yeah, I had a friend of mine who was stalking once, he was going stalking, he came back to the car after going stalking, hadn't shot anything, unloaded his rifle, stuff put it in the way, heard a load of commotion in the bushes, found one of these deer that had been caught up on a fence. So he went to help it, to undo it, to let it go. And as he went home, the deer thrashed around and one of those two caught the back of his leg and it caught the artery on the back of his leg and nearly bled to death. Yeah, so he had to tie it up and drive to the hospital as quickly as possible. Yeah, because they're so sharp, those little teeth, because they've got a little betrayed bit at the back. Uh, Munjak are available to shoot all year round. Why? Because they breed like mumbly. Yeah, they breed like rabbits. A, a, an actual Munjak deer can have a fawn, and within 48 hours of basically having the fawn, they are receptive for breeding again. Right, they're in season. Uh, and that's how quickly they'll turn around, right? So they turn around very quickly. That's how come you've got so many, many mudjack deer in areas. And these deer will live anywhere there is basically a bit of dense undergrowth. They love things like railway lines and sidings where there's basically lots of dense undergrowth. They love eating um, um, bramble, you know, blackberry bushes, yeah? They, they live a lot on that. This is, a, this is what we call a browser. Deer are broken up into two categories. You've got grazers, 
which is what this deer is, yeah, and in a browser, which is what a roe deer is and a mudjack deer is. And that means that they eat the uh, tips of bushes. Yeah, they just tips. So what they're actually doing is pruning the bushes. So what this deer has been basically, it's, it's, it's fault that we have the changing face of basically a lot of our woodland. Because within a lot of our woodlands before, we wouldn't have had bramble encroachment. Yeah, because the bramble will grow in a certain area and it would take a long time to encroach into the wood. But with this deer, what happens is the bramble starts to grow, the deer comes along, eats all the tips, yeah, and, and prunes it. So the bramble sends out another tracer, yeah, and the deer prunes that one. So it sends out another tracer, deer prunes that one. So by pruning the tips, what it does is encouraging the plant to grow further. Then what happens is that deer moves on, or it's shot, or it ends up here, yeah, and then the, the actual bush goes woof and takes over another part of the woodland. And this has changed a lot of our woodland, especially down here in the south of England, if you go to Epping Forest, the large areas of woodland which have been taken over by bramble because of the eating habits of this deer. So weight-wise, 10 to 18 kilos. They can be small, but they can be very stocky. Yeah. <coughs> Seeker. So if you look at the, Japan, the, the Latin name for Seeker, it's uh, service. Now that first name, that first Latin name is exactly the same name as the red deer. So it's service elephantus on the, on the other one. This is service nippon, which is Japanese. And the reason is, is because this is the Asian equivalent of our red deer. So basically they're very closely related. They can actually hybridize and breed together. Although you would never find this deer in this part of the world naturally. <laughs> it would always be the other part, uh, the other side of the world. So these are all the names are exactly the same as the red deer. So staggy, spiker, stag, hind, and calf. So in the summer, they have the spots. You see what I said to you earlier on about the spots? If you look at the bottom natural line along the belly, it's individual spots, as opposed to the long line which you find in the fallow deer. A lot of people confuse these deer with fallow, basically, in the summer. Uh, females basically have the grey coat, and the males have their antlers are smaller than the red deer's. They're more straight up. They have this heart shape white heart shape on the tail and the tail sits in between it the tail is actually white as well when it sits down on it. Seasons exactly the same as the red deer, smaller carpets, 40 to 70, 30 to 45 kilos on this carpet. Really nice eating venison. Um, if we're looking at venison basically the strength of venison or basically how strong it is to eat. If you start with red deer being at the top of the chain, munjack probably being next, then probably it's this, you know, sinker then it'll be fallow, and then it'll be Chinese water deer. Yeah, and that's what's in that gray and red Oh, sorry, row, row would be third along that, and Chinese water deer. Uh, Chinese water deer, unusual looking deer. The back legs are, hot, are taller than the front legs. That's because this deer lives a lot in marshland, right, and a dense marshland. Bark, doe, and fawn. Uh, these do not have any antlers. They have tusks, really long tusks. If you look at the top, the tusks are the top there, yeah. And the tusks are movable, so they can move them backwards and forwards as they need. They use them for fighting, and then the one at the top there, you can see its ears all <coughs> and that's because they cook onto the ears, and they tear through the ears when they're fighting. Yeah? They're very small deer. When you look at them head on, it looks a little bit like a kangaroo looking at you through the middle of the grass, or a teddy bear, because it's got lots of, lots of fluff in its ears. The, the actual uh, fur on them is very dense. If you put your finger there, your finger will disappear up to about there and it's hollow, like all deer fur. All deer fur is hollow. It's great for making flies when you fly fishing, because they float. That's why in the Highlands of Scotland, you'll find um, islands in the middle of nowhere that have got deer on them. You think, well, how the hell did they get there? Well, they'll swim, because they float very, very easily. <coughs> so Chinese water deer, different um, season as well. So it's 1st of November to 31st of March, so they're all in season now. The, but, the males and the females, because there's not a lot of difference between the males and the females. These breed incredibly fast as well, like Munjang. They will have three or four youngsters at once. And what they do is like a hair, they'll drop one here, they'll go one over there, and one over there. And what they'll do is they'll spend their day basically going between the youngsters and feeding all of them. And the reason they do that is that if a predator finds one, it won't find the other two, so there's a chance of survival. Weight-wise, they're 11 to 13 kilos. Although they're very, they look big, but the, the first dense, and it's actually a small carcass. Very lamby, yeah, in, in, in flavour, the actual, very light flavoured venison, a lot of fat on the back of it, on the back end of the venison, right, really lots of fat. It's one of the most fattiest out of all of the air, although the fat is on the outside of the meat, not intramuscularly through the meat. Yeah. Big question. 